Well, good morning. First off, I should get rid of the issue to do with my accent in talking about hockey. Um, it was 30 years ago, actually, roughly a couple of weeks back, that I actually left Thunder Bay. I, my first experience was actually coming to Canada in um, September, long weekend of 1985, to do my master's just up the road here at Lakehead University. So that was my first experience. Two fabulous years here. I think every Canadian should live in a town or city like Thunder Bay. I really got a, a great grounding for the culture of the place and, um, and certainly the diversity, certainly the weather back then. I heard there's not as much snow these days as there was back then, but um, finest skiing in Ontario, of course. Um, I then left, went back home. It was very expensive to be a foreign student in Ontario. Um, built my war chest and I went to the University of Alberta uh, to do my PhD in, in January of 1990 and I've stayed ever since. My specialism actually is around altitude and altitude training, which is why I've been kept in Calgary. And I had the great honour before I went to win sport of being the Director of Sport Physiology and Strategic Planning for Canada's Winter Olympic sports over the last four Olympic cycles. So the four years into Salt Lake, then into Torino, then into Vancouver, and finally into Sochi. And I now basically work for myself and any organizations that I truly believe care for children and youth. Because even though I'm typically measured on the outcomes at World Championships and Olympics, it all starts 20 to 25 years before people like me get to see these youngsters. It starts certainly, if you can, as soon as they're born, but certainly from about four or five years of age through the next at least 15 years in terms of their overall development. And we're gonna talk about that and why you wanna do things which are not simply watered down senior hockey aspects because your children and youth are not adults. You're not adults. They are very, very different animals. And I'm gonna take you through a few slides just to drive those points home for you. And why do we ignore, particularly in child and youth sport, everything that we would never do in other pursuits like music and school, for example. We all understand you go to, you go to school, you go to grade one, and the curriculum is built for grade oneers. It's taught by someone that totally understands how little kids five, six years of age tick. Assessment, AKA competition, is suited for grade oneers. They don't even have the same length of school day as they will in grade 10, 11, and 12. They have a nap in the afternoon and milk and cookies and stuff like that. You go to the school and all the furniture is small. You go look outside at the bike rack. The bikes are all small because the kids are small. So we understand the concept of scaling. They wear small clothes, right? They don't have big meals. They have smaller, lighter implements so that they can learn and can control them. We don't put them in a massive, you know, furniture. You go to the washrooms, even the sinks are all nice and low. They're not having to reach up, all this type of stuff. And yet in sport, we throw them classically into adult scenarios all the time. And I'm going to talk about the fact that even if we were to dress an eight-year-old in hockey gear, Let's jump forward then, a 12-year-old in hockey gear, a 16-year-old in hockey gear, a 20-year-old in hockey gear, and even a 24, and ask them to rush down the ice and back, they don't even produce energy in the same way. So although you as an adult looking on think, oh, they're in hockey equipment, must be doing things the same, they're not. The little kids are very, very aerobic. Big endurance event. They're also actually very explosive, so they can do things very quickly if they're given the opportunity over like one, two seconds. But gradually over time, some of the enzymes in the body start to develop well past puberty, such that by the time you get to 20 to 24 years of age, these players are now much more anaerobic in the way they play hockey. So they don't even play the game exactly the same way. We're still now, we put these little kids on massive surfaces. It doesn't matter whether it's soccer, swimming or anything. We make them do things that adults do, but it's much more of an endurance event for them. And we run into problems where tactically their brains haven't developed that well, so they don't really understand how to play the game. We don't teach them to play the game. <coughs> Even the average kid at, U of a, at LU doing computer science is taught game theory. Game theory. Because there's lots of theory behind how you construct many of the things to do with computer programs. So they understand how is a game constructed, but we don't even bother to teach the kids actually playing that. So the guys that design NHL 2017, for example, on EA Sports, know more about game theory than most of the kids that have gone through 10 to 15 years of the average minor hockey association. Worse still, most of the kids don't get to see many coaches. 
You think of it, once you get past the initiation years and you enter Atom, think how many, how few real head coaches a kid actually gets to see. So it's no wonder we have a bunch of very narrow-minded, inflexible players by the time they get to 15, 16 years of age because they've been taught relatively few systems. And we focus on systems because, to be quite blunt, anyone can run flow drills, anyone can teach a system of play, anyone can design a competition schedule, but it takes real understanding to teach skill, the fundamental skill of skating. Not simply forwards and backwards, but side to side. The inside edge versus the outside edge. The non-dominant leg versus the dominant leg. Skating through traffic, threading the needle, dealing with someone hanging off you or angling you off the puck. How do you deal with that? That's real skating. So who teaches skating? In your organizations from 5 to 10, because I can assure you by the time they're 12 to 14, whatever they've learned before that will be the movement pattern that stays with them for life. And I am fed up as one person dealing with NHL teams that ring me up in April saying, Steve, I've got a 23-year-old defenseman. Can I send him to you guys to teach him to skate backwards? To which the simple answer is no, because you don't have the patience. If you gave us six, seven months, maybe we'd have a chance, but you give us the summer. And not even all the summer, a couple of weeks. So first thing I would do is put them in bed, give them some rest after the season and guarantee as soon as you get them out of bed, they look as though they can skate better because they're fresh. But put them under pressure or fatigue them and they will revert back to the movement pattern they learned as a 10 year old. Pretty simple. We can break it down because here's the thing for all of you as well, no matter what your preconceptions of hockey are, you can definitely teach an old dog new tricks. So we can all learn. It's just particularly between about zero to 15 years of age, these children or youth are extremely plastic and elastic in terms of how their brains are developing. And I'm gonna show you this stuff as to why. And here's the real thing that we always forget about. You can build all the glossy facilities you like, but glossy facilities and multi-million dollar ice arenas do not guarantee development of hockey players. We seem to forget our roots. When I came to Canada, the kids that would play outside, play street hockey, play on the ponds, lots and lots of completely unstructured playtime where they would learn multiple age groups on the outside rink just after school going and playing. But we as adults keep constantly constraining it down. You've got to have this group, you've got to have tiering, you've got to have select groups and all this type of other rubbish. Corey and I were just in, in southern Ontario a few weeks ago being pilloried around some of the suggestions being made, some of the suggestions that our cousins to the south, of course, are implementing and have been doing for a number of years. And here's a very tragic statistic for you. When I arrived in 1990, the composition of the NHL for Canada was north of 98%. Okay, 27 years ago. This year, for the first time ever, we dipped below 51%. You don't think things are changing for us at the top end? And it starts 20 years before those players ever get to the NHL. If we were running PepsiCo or Coca-Cola, you know, or Petro-Canada or something like that, and our market share went from 98% to 51%, we would all be sacked. Sacked. I struggle to wonder where Team Canada for the future on the men's side will come from. We still got a bit of a leg up on the women's side, but they've got their heads buried in the sand, to be quite blunt. And the only team that's looking pretty good, although again chased by the Americans because of good policies that they have, are our sledge hockey team. Riding's on the wall for us. It's English soccer all over again, 50, 60 years ago. Never won the World Cup. Occasionally get to the quarterfinals. Best league in the world, but not many English people playing it. Not on any given Saturday or Sunday. So understand what the writing on the wall is, and it all starts with our youngsters. And I'm not here to talk to you about Team Canada. I'm here to talk to you about your goal and my suggestion to you that the primary metric that you want to measure your success on is the number of kids that start in initiation. Do you have the biggest percentage of them finish at the end of high school still with you? How many kids are still playing hockey? We have to have a few rule changes to make sure kids can still play well into grade 12, 18 years of age. That should be our metric, because then we're setting them up to do whatever they're going to do next. And you will find the people that myself and Corey are interested in 
who eventually play for Team Canada. Remember, despite what the media think, there are very few teenagers that go into the NHL. You want to play more than five games in the NHL? For a start, be 23 years of age. Simple. We're going to produce Connor McDavid just purely by the numbers that we have playing in Ontario. But Ontario as a province is failing us miserably in terms of its actual conversion at the highest level, considering the numbers. You know, there are, there are small towns in Finland and Sweden that outperform the whole of the greater Toronto metropolitan area in terms of production of quality players. Because they understand this, it's all about people, number one. Good people, great adults, running great programs. And then you come to places. So people, programs, places. But I can take you to many places in the world where you don't need a great place necessarily if you've got great people who understand great programming and understand the concept of grade one to grade two, and grade two to grade three, and grade three to grade four. It takes 12 years. The exams get more serious the further you go up. And people who really know child and youth development understand that 85 to 96 percent of the age group champions are not the people that win at the senior level. There is no such thing outside of very, very few outliers that anyone can recognize, true outliers. And that doesn't just mean being able to skate a little bit better than their peer group. I mean true outliers. No such thing as a six-year-old champion or 12-year-old champion, 13-year-old champion. For this is a redundant concepts. I didn't even bother to look at who wins at those ages. Very few of them will be around when it counts, or be any good. They just happen to have a fast trajectory early, win some meaningless, I don't know, peewee tournament. Let's get a grip. If you look at the last three major studies done on team sports in North America, including hockey, if you listen to what the participants say, the kids between novice through to major junior, the number one reason for staying in hockey, number one reason according to the players, having fun. Number one reason for not staying in the game, not having fun. So at 13 years of age, massive dropout in females, all sports. 15 years of age, massive dropout in males. And we've allowed, of course, physical education to decline in our schools. So they don't even have to do that in school. So at 13 to 15 years of age, we've got kids dropping out of physical activity left, right and centre, and no one picks it up. And of course, all the sports are in competition <coughs> with each other. You don't work with swimming or tennis or soccer. You see them as being the adversarial groups that you're dealing with. So you're all in competition for these kids, but it's their lives, not ours. And they are only six once, eight once, 10 once, 12 once, 365 days to give them the best possible grounding. And remember, no one wants to be a kid's last age group coach. It's tough enough on those guys coaching the 17 and 18 year olds as it is because you're handing them off into the big void. But you don't want to be the last kid's coach at 12, 13. Well, I'm not coming back next year, coach. That says something about you and your groups. So, now that I've hit you over the head a little bit. <laughs> and the only reason I say I'm deeply passionate about it, I mean, I mean, absolutely. You know, I have children myself, you know, I know it's tough. The whole system fights everything. But unless you start, because you are the decision makers, not me, not Corey, we can only provide you the information. And of course, as soon as I open my mouth with my accent, people say, what the hell does he know about hockey? But I've looked after Team Canada, men, women and sledge now, for close to a mm, decade and a half, over a decade. First day on the job at UFC, 1995. First meeting I ever had with Tom Rennie and, and Mike Johnston when they ran the in-residence program. I'd been around the block. And sport is sport. So this actually, most of this was a presentation because the International Ice Hockey Federation are very interested in what's going on. Virtually every country in the world is really examining what they've been doing. Many have, some have got 25 years head start on us. If you look at the, the Swedes and the Finns and the Czechs, our cousins to the south, you know, almost, almost a decade they've been thinking about this and implementing, doing a very job. You know, there were, I, I just went to the Project Play conference in Washington. This is a massive consortium. The Americans, again, when they move, they really move. So education, sport, health, all in one room. United States Olympic Committee, all the sport federations, all the different bodies, Michelle Obama, the whole crew, all there, 
talking about youth sport. They showed the stats for 40 sports over the last three years and only three had increasing numbers of participants. USA Hockey was one of those. At a time when through the 90s, we've seen a 50% drop off in hockey participation in this country with every age group change. That tells us the kids are telling us that we're screwing up. So, a bit of background done that. We're going to give you some information. We're going to talk about the importance of competition. Don't let anyone tell you that competition is not important. It is, and it is at every age group. Okay? One of the things you want to do is, the stuff we teach them, when we put them into the exam, can they do it? That tells you how effective you've been. It's how you get to that. And is competition one of the metrics you're looking at? Is the win-loss aspect for a bunch of six to ten-year-olds that important? No. I'd want to know how they're playing the game. Can they skate? You watch, just as an aside, you watch, even at the NHL level, how many players cannot do a gross motor skill and a fine motor skill. So in other words, that means like skate at full speed and pass or shoot the puck while still skating, not on the glide. And you look how, how few can actually do that. And that goes back 10 to 15 years earlier because they could have been taught that stuff. Or the number of guys that can only turn to the inside of the blade to protect the puck. Okay, so they push off the dominant, I'm right-handed, dominant leg, push to the inside, the puck's on the left-hand side of my blade, I can do it that well. It takes a little bit more effort to go to the back side of the blade, pushing off my non-dominant leg, but you could have been taught that. But of course, it's always the path of least resistance. People want to rush to the winning component, don't look at the skill first. It's like building a Lego tower, but instead of building a nice big base, you just have one brick and go as high as you can. It's going to fall over soon enough. Because us adults are controlling what we want to see as the outcome. And we look at the wrong metric. So you have to have an open mind. We're going to talk about this journey. We're not all of it. We're going to really sort of concentrate on, let's see, we're going to concentrate on basically from about here, 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 and finally to here. These are these dreary teenage years. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, overall, we have this childhood concept. Think of this. Once a kid hits the, the growth spurt that you all can clearly recognize, that actually marks the end of biological childhood. Okay? That is a very, very important period. So typically, that's to about girls up to about age 10, maybe 11, certainly 9 to 11 years of age. The boys through to about 12 years of age. This is a very, very important period for teaching basic skills. Absolutely fundamental and making sure you have very, very high practice to game ratios. You think how often we rush immediately some of the best one-to-one -one or maybe even two practices to one game. You'd never accept that in school. You're going to have two lessons to every exam? Give me a break. Well, still, we do really stupid stuff, like we select teams before we've even taught them anything. Start of each season, we put them on a, into some kind of tryouts as though they were NHL or Major Junior or something like that. And we do a tryout to get on teams. Some places even do the tryouts at the end of the previous season, forgetting the fact that kids are going to grow dramatically through the summer months, do lots of different experiences, and could be completely different animals by the time they get to September. But we do that type of shit. Adolescence and young adulthood, and then on into that. It's a very complex process. I'm not going to be able to give you all the information. I'm just going to give you the stuff where I'm hitting you over the head with a telephone book to make you think. Don't know all the answers. There are no simple answers. There's no one way to do all this. But there's certainly a framework that we can provide you with. You need to think about what is on the dashboard of what you're trying to do with a bunch of six-year-olds versus a bunch of 10-year-olds versus a bunch of, say, 16-year-olds. The dashboard looks very different. Think of what the skating icon would look like for the six-year-olds versus the 10-year-olds versus the 16-year-olds. Very different. Okay, here's the start of the boring stuff. Along the bottom, the first two decades of life, roughly, from zero years of age to about 22. On the vertical scale, a percentage scale where 100% is the adult final level that we get to as we evolve, right? With me on that? So this first line is the neural development curve. Think, think really brain size, brain weight, 
the internet of the body, because that's basically what we're talking about, the nervous system, how the brain, the CPU, the central processing unit, communicates with the rest of the body, because that's how we're gonna move, that's gonna how we're gonna take our decisions and make them into actions. So you can see, once the baby is born, there is a massive increase in brain size over the first decade to 12 to 13 years. Okay, with me on that, see that clearly? Then there's a gradual sort of plateau. Don't think the brain development is over, it's just that now we're starting to use that increasing capacity in new situations. We're learning how to use the brain that we've developed. That should be a clue to you. We're learning how to use the brain that we have developed in the previous 10 to 12 years. That should tell you that the two bits are slightly different in what you're doing. And why is this growth happening? It's happening because the baby comes out of the womb and obviously the brain has been developing in the womb, but now it's it's faced with pressure changes, temperature changes, it's sight and sound and all these type of elements coming at it which cause the brain to respond to this and actually grow and develop these sensory systems to be able to deal with this. And there are some very crucial ones that if you do not allow to develop, don't. Or they become increasingly more difficult. So there are some that it's actually a glycine, and others where it's more a period of sort of reasonable sensitivity to improvement. And you can, if you're patient, teach an old dog new tricks. It just becomes more difficult. Even you, even though our brains are somewhat plateaued overall, we can definitely grow new um, information highways all the time. We develop new synapses every single day. If we constantly challenge ourselves and, and think about new things, we can also continue to grow, but nowhere near at the rate as you can in those first 10 to 12 years. Is that clear? So for example, here's a, here's a window that is ruthless. A baby born with cataracts. So there is a physical block to light and other information coming in through the eye to go down the optic nerve to the rapidly developing sight sensing capability of the brain. So that's not happening. So the sight sensing component of the brain, I'm pointing at the back, but I mean the front, um, doesn't actually happen. So unless the pediatrician catches the fact that a child, a baby has cataracts within the first six months of birth, even if the uh, cataracts are removed, that baby will be blind. That's a very short window of development compared to something like rhythm. Well, rhythm is probably ultimately set down somewhere before the age of eight. Okay, so you've got eight years to get after that. How many of you encourage music and movement, even in your practices? Or encourage or suggest that before you come to hockey, put your kid into dance and gymnastics? as a grounding for being able to do something athletic in the future. You think the rhythm of the slap shot, the rhythm of skating, the rhythm of the glove save, the rhythm of the pad save. Rhythm is inherent in sport. But you don't have long to get after that. And then you know what everyone looks like at 25 at the wedding when they're drunk a bit and they just can't move. Okay? And we all laugh. And it started two decades before. Compared to this particular line, which is the one we all get really sort of hopped up about, this is a rough approximation of what happens with the endocrine system, the hormonal system that really can't, starts to come on stream as kids go through and past puberty. And in this case, this is a rough approximation of the male sex hormone testosterone, which is present in both males and females, but obviously at a much higher level in the males. This is one of the signaling mechanisms that brings about, say, the onset of the sexual characteristics, the second ones for, for males and females, the deepening of the voice, for example, and the other appendages that come along with, with adolescence. But more importantly, the ability to lay down muscle mass, hypertrophy. Before that upswing, very little chance of systematically building muscle mass other than that is naturally happening due to basic growth. So no point doing a whole bunch of like, you know, some manic Olympic or NHL type off ice system to build muscle in a bunch of prepubescence. This graph should actually tell you that kids learn to move and get stronger because of the neural system in that first decade of life. They learn how to move. So that coupled to the fact that they're growing makes them look as though they're getting stronger and they are indeed, but nowhere near to the level that they can once they come past 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years of life, both males and females, although so obviously slightly earlier for the females. Very clear on that? Okay. Do not read into that that I'm saying do not do 
off-ice work with your kids? Of course you are. But what does it look like? It certainly doesn't look like what a major junior team or, heaven forbid, an NHL team is doing or even the women's national program. They should be doing games. You should be encouraging them to go outside. They should be doing lots of other sports. Wherever possible, they should play seasonally, for God's sake. Isn't that a clue? I just sat on a commitment team, well, a number of years ago. Bob Mancini was there as well with Igor Larianov. I don't know who you know, if you know who he is. Probably one of the players of all time. Perhaps in Canada, we don't really think about him, but this guy's won absolutely everything. A Detroit Red Wing, a Russian. You know, he's won everything from countless Stanley Cups through to the World Championships, through to the Olympics, you name it. Okay, slight man, he's not much taller than me, okay, imports wine these days. His kid plays peewee hockey, well he's a bit older than that now actually, he's probably up into, um, what would he be in, midget by now? I guess so. He was playing midget peewee hockey in, in the Detroit Minor Association and Igor made the comment that he was ready to pull him out of that because his kid was going to play 80 games that year. At a time when Igor and the rest of the Russians never played more than 45. But what they did do when they came home from school every day during the winter, they went outside and played with all their friends, all different shapes and sizes, and played hockey until they were called in for supper. Then they would come in, do have supper, finish their homework, and if there was enough time, then mum might let them to go out. And then when the ice melted, they played soccer and handball, and went running and went to the lake and did all this other type of stuff. What we've done, we've industrialised hockey. In Calgary, we have rules where we don't even allow kids to play street hockey. Why? Because Adults complain about the noise outside, or you have to slow down your car instead of rip through an, uh, an, a little residential area. And we get litigated so that we can't go on a pond, and no one's going to use some common sense, like if we've had a run of sort of 20 degrees centigrade weather that you might not want to go and skate on a lake. But for a few days all the time, we can skate outside, let the kids have fun. It's cheap. What we've done, though, now is you have to play hockey on an ice arena. You have to be driven there by a car because it's normally somewhere else. It's not right in your neighborhood. The game has changed for us, but we haven't in the way we're dealing with it. So, you all understand this, which means that the overall curve of development for humans is somewhat sigmoidal, okay? So you have that period where the little blue dots are coming up, so a lot of development things happening, a lot of change for the kid up to about four, five, six years of age. Then there's a period of relative stability until the growth spurt happens and then all hell breaks loose until that's all over and done with and you finally have this miniature adult or young adult standing next to you. Which means that there are two global things for you in minor sports to understand. Up until about this period, Lots and lots of different activities, very, very high practice to game ratios. Doesn't mean to say you can't scrimmage and do other sort of mini, like going to school. There's a place where the finals are, but there are midterms and pop tests all the way along. What do those look like? Yes, it means us adults have to do some work and be a bit creative about what it looks like, what that experience is. Remember the kids said they like fun. And the one thing I guarantee that you as adults completely control in all of this is the environment in which those kids are. You control that. How many rules? How much fun? Do you understand how a five-year-old's gonna behave versus a 10-year-old? Do you teach your coaches about the target age group that they're dealing with rather than the meaningless drills? Yeah? I bet you don't because even most of our coach education is very linear. Go and do level one, level two, level three. There's some changes now with competency aspects. But we don't really teach to the target audience. What do you need to know to teach five to eight year olds? What do you need to know to teach nine to 12 year olds? What do you need to know to teach 13 through to 15 year olds? And then finally, if you're getting serious, 16 to 18 year olds. We don't teach that though. We teach the same rubbish to everyone. And yet communication and understanding the environment is the most important thing. Compared to this phase now, where this gets a bit more serious, but look at the ages that we're dealing with. The very last few years of minor hockey and into the senior stuff where relatively few people are playing in the first place. Just make this sink. And yet we are often doing all this stuff right here, down with this lot. Okay, let's move on. Different graph, same two decades of life. Up at the top, 
This is rate of change of height in a calendar year. Rate of change. So anything that appears above the horizontal white line, the kid is growing. It's just down at the bottom is about one centimeter a year. Up around the top of the arrow is about 12 to 15 centimeters a year. Here's North American girls. Okay, sorry about, I couldn't hold my hand steady enough on my mouth, so it's a bit squiggly. So you can see that in the first few years, one to two, they're growing very, very fast. And it gradually slows until about the age of two. And then it starts to plateau off. And then for girls at around sort of somewhere between 10, 11, 12, it takes off again and reaches that peak. And that peak that you see just about, uh, where is it, just about there is known as peak height velocity, PHV, the greatest rate in change in height in a calendar year. And in North American girls, that's about mm, 13 to 14 years of age. Sorry, let me go back. About uh, uh, 12 to 14 years of age. Certainly around 13 years of age, you're gonna capture most girls. Does it mean every girl that you come across follows that pattern? No. Some are gonna go a little earlier. Some are gonna start growing a little later. Some are gonna have a massive spike. So they grow at 12 years of age and they go from like four for eight and then they're five for eight and they're gonna be like that for life. And then there are others that grow much slower over a longer period of time. But the vast majority of girls will follow that pattern. Okay, this point here, okay, marks the end of childhood, as I said to you before. So this through here, you've got a lot of time, but less time with girls to do the right things. Because, why did I make that comment about less time with girls? Because you know, you don't need me to tell you, that boys grow later than girls. So you've got a bit longer time with the boys before they hit their growth spurt to do good stuff. Teach them to skate, teach them soft hands, teach them to pass, teach them to, well, everything you need to do, inside, outside of the edge. Do anything with that puck that they possibly can. Because remember, the whole point, even though it's a team sport, it's ultimately what, if I'm holding my stick, it's what I can do inside this circle of my stick, whether I'm stationary or obviously moving. That circle stays the same, the reach of my stick. I should be able to do absolutely anything with that puck whilst performing the most complex movement task possible. That's your goal. And to get the basis of that, at least by the age of 14, because after that, you're gonna have less opportunity to make the change. But of course, if you have terrible practice to game ratios, where at a game, even if you only have two lines and you turn up at the ice for a 60 minute game and you play a fair line distribution, they're sitting on the bench for 30 minutes. It gets even worse once you go to more lines, go to three lines, 20 minutes on the bench, 20 minutes actually playing, 40 minutes on the bench. If we were running a business, we would be killed with that kind of mentality. Time on task, getting worse and worse and worse. That's what the pros do. But remember, each one of them is fighting for that ice time. That's a very different world, world than actually trying to teach kids. We should have a few lines as possible and as many games as possible, but with short periods of time. That's why I said what you can do in scrimmaging. And put things into practice. But we teach it all like NHL, all the way down through the system. Who came up with little kids playing 60 minutes anyway? Have you ever seen a third period for most young kids? Most of them are dead on their feet. Adult entertainment, that's what we're dealing with. So, these two dotted lines, I wanna make a real serious message for you. So, when the kids hit that growth spurt, the long bones of the body are growing very rapidly, okay? So the, body, the bones of the legs and the arms, we don't actually stand on our arm, so it doesn't really contribute to height. But it's why, through the growth spurt for both boys and girls, one minute they look like a bunch of orangutans with long arms, the next minute they're all legs, and then they're orangutans again for a while, and then they're all legs. It just grows and fits and starts. But the long bones are growing very rapidly. As you come over the peak, and the growth rate starts to slow, what is actually happening is that these long bones, like the femur of, say, a 14-year-old boy, because that's the peak roughly for North American boys, roughly at around 14, they're growing at their fastest, not for every one of them, but for most, the growth plates around the end of the bones are starting to close. Once they close up, then that bone will no longer grow in length, okay? But there's a bit of an issue, because the bones are quite fragile. 
If we were to rip a femur out of a 14-year-old boy, turn it on its end, cut through it and peer inside, the trabecular bone, the bone that actually give it, gives it its tensile strength, is not that well developed yet. Think of a, you know those chalky bars, a crunchy bar, right? It's got cr it's chocolate on the outside, it's got that honeycomb in the middle. Think of that crunchy bar and what its strength would be like with no honeycomb. You could crush it very easily, right? So kids actually have a fracture window as they're coming over the top of that um, massive growth period. This is why groups like the American College of Pediatrics, the Canadian Academy of Sport Medicine, get upset with all contact sports at certain ages. And the, and the fact that we don't allow differences in rules to allow for the fact that we're kind of setting the kids up for some disastrous events. But of course, we don't think that way, do we, as adults? We think of what the big guys are doing. So we don't make amends for the fact that they're little kids still. So this bone then develops very rapidly, and these are what the dotted lines are showing, showing the rate of change in bone mineral density, which happens about 18 to 24 months after peak height velocity. And guess what the biggest driving forces to develop that bone are? You might think calcium in the diet and all that type of stuff. Certainly a supporting factor, but the reality is loading forces on the skeletal system. This would be like running, loading forces, throwing something, doing weights, all that type of stuff, catching something, passing the puck, okay? Usually for most humans, very dominated to the lower extremities because we walk around all the day, all that type of stuff. We don't do that much stuff with the upper body. Another reason why, even through this period, you want to do lots of games, circuit training, all this type of stuff to load the body to develop strong bones. Because here's the health consequence for Canada, five, six, seven decades after that period of time. You think of the incidence now of hip fracture in Canadian society. And one of the tangibles that's linked back to is the quality of physical education at games that was happening when they were 12 to 18 years of age. And I just told you earlier that most of our girls are dropping out of sport at 13 and our boys at 15. So they don't even do this. We have a massive, massive issue coming for us over the next 10, 12, sorry, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years as we've allowed these kids to drop out of physical activity and the, the rise of screen time and all these other types of stuff of sitting on your butt. And that's before we get into food and soda and all these type of things all of which are working against us. So you have a real responsibility in hockey and in kids' sport for the long-term health of Canadian society, not just worrying about Team Canada or your kids having a good time. There's that period of good stability, okay? Teach them all sorts of things, run, jump, throw, kick, strike, catch, all these type of things. Balance, coordination, speed, drop dead speed that is, like very fast speed compared to this period of time, which is where we really all get hopped up about, okay? Right through here, cutting kids, the whole concept of cutting, and all this type of stuff, trying to choose who's gonna be good. How on earth do you know with all this change going on? No clue, no clue. No one in their right mind would do any kind of talent identification at that time, no one. The true outliers, you can spot through all this, but they're very few. That's why they're called outliers, not all of us. The brain is developing. So above the line, this is the front, okay? Below the line, this is the front, and this is the top. This is showing you the maturity of the brain as it moves from yellows and, and greens to the indigos, and particularly one area of the brain that is extremely important eventually, but is very late developing, and that is this area around the prefrontal cortex. Okay, as you can see, it develops relatively late. Here's about 15 to 18 years of age here. Okay, this is why any of you who have teenagers are trying to teach teenagers or deal with teenagers that they don't get out of bed until 12 o'clock, if you're lucky, on a Saturday. They can't tidy their rooms. They have very poor timekeeping. They don't deal with authority. They take much greater risk, all because that part of their brain hasn't fully developed yet. Don't fight it. It's reality. And the fact that the person might be as a girl, I don't know, 5'8", and a guy six foot, and a guy shaving twice a day, doesn't tell you exactly what's going on inside. Another reason why, as a coach, you need to communicate. Understand what that animal is that you're dealing with. 
The other thing I mentioned about basic skills, this is a nine-year-old, and you'll notice that it's a soccer example. I'm trying to make you think a little bit so-called out of the box here, not show you ex examples from hockey. I talked about controlling the environment, because even if making the pass, you're going to do it from inside this circle, or the soccer player, I'm going to do it from inside the reach of my, my uh, limbs, right? So it's controlling this environment. And if you can control this environment, as they grow, you can teach them on the brain all the tactics you like. You can teach them about the flow of the game and you can put them into any situation if they have the basic skills. But if you can't pass or receive the puck and you can't skate, tough luck playing at a higher level. Nine years of age, not on some pristine soccer pe pe pitch, urban environment. You'll see him point at the crossbar, see him pull up his pants and ask yourself, how did the kid develop these skills? And I can assure you, it wasn't coming along and being run through a bunch of flow drills once or twice a week. Countless hundreds of billions of ball contacts. So what does that look like? You'll think, oh my God, it's going to be absolute chaos on the ice. Yes, it is. Every kid with the puck for as long as possible. What does that look like? Have you the ability to pay attention to one small group of kids whilst the rest are still doing stuff? Not having them stand around. Average flow drill, eight seconds of doing something, two minutes of standing behind on the line, doing nothing, bored out of their tree. That allows them to think about stuff they'd be rather doing. Points to the crossbar. Pulls his pants up. So what does hockey control look like? What can a netminder do as they come through 10, 11, 12 years of age? Or any of the other players? And a beautiful, beautiful smile to finish there. Okay? Where do you think they learn that? I can assure you not all of it from a structured practice. What kind of play work, homework do you give your kids? Do you throw them each a tennis ball and say, come back next week, show me what you can do with that? <coughs> Encourage them because it's in those countless hours and then even your own practices. Okay? What could you do off the ice so that you can preserve your precious and expensive ice time? I can teach you everything. We can move the tables away out of this room and I could teach you everything to do with the tactics of the game of hockey in this room. We could line it up with hockey tape, okay, we could move, I could move you around the room and teach you absolutely everything and we haven't even gone on the ice yet. That car park, get a bunch of Swedish wooden balls, I can teach you everything to do with soft hands, passing accuracy, all that type of stuff. Oh no, we have to have ice. Bullshit. Far better to teach them all this stuff and then when they come to the ice they know what to do and you don't have to talk that much. Because the other clock that I would put into every arena on the planet would be the dollar sign clock. And every time you stop your group to talk to them, it starts. 100 bucks just went by, just like that. Because you haven't even bothered to understand that you need to preserve that ice time. And you can teach them anything you need to know about any sport, often away from the venue. Even swim coaches deal with arm actions and leg actions on the side of a deck of a pool without actually getting wet. Or show video. Or use the Hockey Canada app to help you design your programs. Okay, I talked about energy systems. I'm gonna be finishing up here quick. I talked about energy systems earlier and I want to show you, here's the first two decades of life, percentage of change, percentage of change. This is aerobic power. You may have heard of it as in terms of a maximal term, maximal aerobic power. This is the ability to take in oxygen, transport it around the body, and use it by whatever organ needs it. The brain, the heart, the lungs, the muscles. Right? As kids are aging, okay, their improvement in maximal aerobic power changes quite dramatically. Now, I've just shown you all the growth stuff. 
So you can understand why their improvement and why they're so aerobic young is because of what is happening to them from a growth point of view. Think here we are, we've got 11 through to 17 years of age. So the kid's gone from here to here. Bigger lungs, bigger heart, bigger lung volume, bigger muscles, etc., etc. It's no wonder we are designed to be able to use oxygen much better through that massive growth period. Everything's changing for us. With me on that? And then gradually now you have to get into serious stuff as you get older to, in terms of being able to train it because you now can't rely on growth and development to do it for you. Clear on that? Okay, compared to these two lines, which are much more to do with the adult game. This is all to do with the anaerobic systems, the ability to produce energy very quickly and at high levels, which is very important for something like the game of hockey. But interesting enough, down here, kids don't even have the enzymes in sufficient capability to develop energy anaerobically. So all these sort of 14, 15, 16 year olds you think are whizzing down the ice aren't necessarily doing it in the same way you think. Much later, the ability to develop blood lactate, okay, a so-called byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis, a high energy yield system, an anaerobic one, very important in the game of hockey, an anaerobic capacity, ability to go out and do something very, very intense, come back, sit on the bench and get ready to do it again and again and again not really coming into fruition until much later on. The gain is not even the same. So I really want to stress that to you. Just because they all have the same stuff on, you know, and you're putting on the same surface of the ice. Very different for the pubescence, the pubescence and others. And here's a one that I really hope drives home the issue of the challenge to you of early selection. So I chose this graph particular because there's no skill involved. It's a bunch of guys, little boys, between the age of 12 and 19 by Robert Molina and Claude Bouchard's work. Robert Molina is one of the finest exercise pediatricians in North America. He's a physician in the States, focuses on children, the epidemic of overuse injuries. Claude Bouchard is a geneticist and health researcher at the University of Montreal. One of the leaders actually of the Harvard long-term studies as well. Really knows his stuff. So they're pulling on this tensionometer, okay, and that generates a kilogram force. And then what they did is they tracked the boys, both cross-sectionally, a bunch of 12-year-olds, a bunch of 13-year-olds, but also a group that they watched over close to a decade. And then they divided them into early, average, and late matures based on the x-ray of the hand. Because remember those growth plates I told you about? Where you can tell the biological age as opposed to the chronological. And what's the difference? The biological age is our genetic clock that's ticking, which is different for all of us, right? Whereas the chronological age is something we've invented, the stopwatch of life. As soon as the kid's born, you start the stopwatch, the calendar, that just happens. So, for example, let me say this to you. Right now, the 14-year-old um, boys who are going through their peak high velocity, those are the, what, 2003 borns, right? 2003 borns. So you have all these boys, all chronologically 14, but because that particular period of time is where the greatest rate of change and variability occurs, in the 2003 borns right now, biologically, you could have a bunch of 12-year-olds and a bunch of 16-year-olds, and you're going to try and compare them? But here's the thing. As they come through to their 20s, they all reach the same point in the end. Clearly shown by this. So the early matures, you can see them coming. They're, they're, growing faster than their teammates, they've got good neural systems, they can pull on this and reef and make a big score, whereas the late matures, no. But if you're prepared to have the patience, they all get to the same point in the end. And there is great evidence, of course, if you look at that trajectory, to show that the late developers come past the early developers. So if you're interested in winning at 14 years of age, of course you're going to select this group. This group might hang around because they think they've got a chance. This group basically get told they suck. Okay, so they're out the door and so forth and so forth. And here's the challenge, and this is really the argument for us with what's going on in Toronto. So you decide to have a bunch of U6 selects. U6! What thing on the planet does that? Well, they're doing it. And here's the thing. Corey and I and others, Hockey Canada, we're eventually looking for these 23 to 28 year olds who can play against the greatest on the planet. They're not even going to be in the game because we keep selecting new sixes and therefore all the others get told they're crap and leave. 
So you don't think this stuff actually affects even the high performance? Of course it does. Of course it does. I remember currently in the GTL, 0.0001% will play more than one game in the NHL who start out in initiation. <laughs> Great. So physical literacy, get after it, your responsibility. How do you team up with other sports? Do you even actually, as a minor association, have an arrangement? Do you put all your kids into soccer? Do you encourage them to go do soccer in the spring and summer or in the fall? Do they play ultimate? Do you actually put hockey teams into other leagues to do stuff? Do you have gymnastics for hockey? Do you teach them to swim? Lots of lakes around here. Do you run summer camps that are multi-sport? Think about a hockey camp where every morning you do hockey, but every afternoon you bring in someone else to teach a different sport. So in the space of five days, they get exposed to six sports. Your sport, because it's a hockey camp, every day, all morning long. But then they do tennis in one, on Monday, and they go swimming on Tuesday, and they do something else on Thursday. Get the idea? You can help. And you're not just helping the system, you're helping these kids. And you're far likely to keep them longer that way. And what is the problem with a kid discovering another sport through you? And maybe one day when they're CEO of, I don't know, some major corporation or they've got an Olympic medal in some sport, they turn around and say, I had an amazing time with Northwestern Ontario hockey or whatever it might be. Taught me all I need to know. I remember this coach, he was amazing. She was amazing. Okay. Just an example, chronological age versus biological age. All 14 years of age, all of them. But you've got a 12-year-old and you've got the 16-year-old. Who do you think is winning right now? Well, look at this guy on the right. right. He probably can perform an iron cross without even breathing hard. Okay, the other kid can't even get on the pommel horse. Yet yeah, maybe he's the best. The other thing is, do we don't understand basic rules? By all means, do some pre-testing to evaluate what you need to do and tier so that you can make sure that you you're able to adjust appropriately tier nothing wrong with tiering if it's used for the right reasons which is not simply short-term competition it's about how you can structure things but remember there's also very good reasons to bring people together with different competences in training environments one of the things you can teach more advanced people about is the fact that the less competent are very random in their movements. And random is good to expose people to because it makes them think. What do you think tennis players often, you get the top 10 in the world, they're always constantly losing to people ranked 140th. Why? Because the 140th people do not play the game like everyone else from zero to 50 in the world. So the guy, Roger Federer, is expecting this guy to hit the ball straight down the line because anyone else that's good would do that. This guy doesn't, hits the ball over there. Meanwhile, Roger's standing over here thinking, holy shit, I can't get there. <laughs> then you teach them something, okay? And then you have the final exam. School understands that and you have little interventions in between in terms of pop tests and, and uh, midterms and all that. We all understand that. But we force our kids into NHL type leagues. And we all know that, oh yeah, they get pretty good by the end of the year. They're starting to gel. Of course they do. It's the system. So I wouldn't even look at some of the results in the first part of the year, but then of course you get to playoffs and then we do stupid stuff. Like we, f we actually do exactly what the NHL does. So on the first weekend of the playoffs in most minor association, 50% of the teams will no longer be involved. And that happens like right at the end of February. So now we've got the rest of the Canadian winter when most of our kids aren't even playing hockey anymore. Or they're forced into more expensive tournaments that they have to travel to. And any time you travel, you drive the costs up. And you waste time. Because why would you want to be stuck in a car or a coach? Certainly kids don't. And you don't need to see a bloody hotel with a bunch of water slides 20,000 times in your career. I've been told that. Oh, but the kids like going. And they get to the water slide, give me a break. Is there something better that you could do for the child after they've seen water slide a few times with the thousand dollars you're gonna blow that weekend? I guarantee there is. Take them to Mexico, have a tennis lesson. I don't care what it is. But remember, expose them to as many different things as possible in that first decade, decade and a half of life. So. There's only a difference in this rule. Sometimes this could be like you have your midterm 
And sometimes when you're doing something, you need to give them a bit of a rest before the final exam, aka taper. So as they get a bit older and whatever, you want to make sure you do your initial pretest, see how they're doing, change everything, do your intervention, get, then see how they're doing right at the end of that intervention. But they may not be fully recovered, so you have to give them a bit of a rest before the final exam. Okay, and it may be that they haven't played many games. So in that final period, you do a bunch of pretest games to get ready for the ones that are important, as long as you allow for a different rest. This is the way people that know what they're doing organize things. And eventually, if you're really good, if this is a periodized plan, and remember, for your kids, the goal is to just simply get them better each year by the end. That's the goal. Not a whole long season. That's what the pros do because they're already at this level. We're trying to get our kids better and better and better over the year, just like school. So you have your general prep, specific prep, you come through in your pre-comp, and then you have your competition. And really, the goal should be that the most difficult exam is as late as possible in the year, when they've had more time to get prepared, and you've taught them more, and they've got more experience, as long as you can get rid of any fatigue. So, I'm going to finish there. I just wanted to make sure that uh, you understood where I'm coming from because I'm going to be leading into the gentlemen who are coming later today that they're going to tell you a lot more important stuff about hockey than I am. I'm just the generalist. But I want to really give you some ammunition to make sure that you can talk about this and why suggestions are being made to and why, unfortunately, because you know, we're a monolith, you know, we're a massive hockey community world in, in Canada but why we are very slow to turn the boat. And unfortunately, the signs are already there that we're not acting fast enough and we're not paying attention to what's important. And in the past, a lot of what I've described to you went on naturally. Kids did this stuff. They walked more, they biked more, they played outside more. All the stuff I've talked about that we now actually almost have to create artificially. And all we've done is narrow it down to the mainstream more and more. And at the same time, costs going through the roof. And we have all the other challenges of technology that are coming into effect and choice for these kids. So if you truly love this sport and you truly love these kids, let kids be kids. Okay? Thank you very much.